Okay, so <clears throat> today we're going to start our um, first lecture on unsupervised learning, right? So, so far we've been mostly talking about the other class of machine learning, which is supervised learning. So we've been talking about linear classification, regression models, and then um, logistic regression going on towards uh, neural network. Then we discuss CNNs and RNNs, all right? So we are at the point uh, that um, I thought it was needed to have a, a few lectures on unsupervised learning and see how those techniques are going to help us uh, gain more insight about the data that we don't have any label on those, right? Then um, we're going to carry on with some um, theoretical um, machine learning background about bias variance and uh, pack learning. And then perhaps we're going to conclude the course with that. All right, so as, as you recall from the early lectures of the course, we were classifying, uh, categorizing different classes of machine learning. So the second class was unsupervised learning. The, the major difference was that we didn't have any labels, right? So our data set D containing all those vectors of input, and all of them are coming from the dimensional space of R, they don't have any labels, right? So we don't have anything to relate these x's to those uh, corresponding true values of y, right? So there's just some bunch of data. It's as if <clears throat> you wanted to classify or group your coins, right, into three different, four different uh, coin set, let's say, using their size and mass. And these are different classes of labels you had, like five cents, quarter, I don't know, um, one dollar or a cent, okay? So in a, if we uh, categorize it as an unsupervised learning problem, it's as if I'm just making it all black and white. So there is no distinction between the labels of the data I have. So what you are given is just a plain set of coin, right? And you have to find a way in order to understand and cluster them, right? or find them, group them into things that you think they belong to uh, so that they, you can just downsample the size perhaps or gain other knowledge, okay? So there are so many things, um, so many methods in un unsupervised learning. One of the most popular one is the uh, clustering methods, which we're gonna discuss today. Uh, for clustering, we're gonna talk about k-means clustering, which is uh, an iterative process, pretty easy to understand, and it's very popular. So we're going to discuss k-means today. And next session, we're going to talk about another extension of sort of k-mean using density estimation method, uh, which is EM algorithm. Okay. So the other major um, subclass of unsupervised learning is density estimation. Unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss these, the first three histogram, nearest neighbor, density estimation, pars and windows. But next session, we're going to talk about Gaussian mixture model, or GMMs. Um, and an algorithm called EM, right, for that matter. Today, we're going to discuss clustering and an algorithm, which is known as k-means. OK. The third major class of unsupervised learning is methods that help us to reduce dimensionality. Okay, I'm not sure if it was a T here or S. Yeah. Is it a T or S? Is S okay? Yeah, I always confuse that. So uh, dimensionality reduction techniques, the most famous one is PCA, or uh, principal component analysis. The other one is factor analysis or exploratory factor analysis, EFA. And recently, uh, another extension of deep learning models is called uh, autoencoders that does the dimension reduction for you and, and encoding and decoding while you train a model. So unfortunately for all of these, we don't have time uh, since we are just talking about an introductory course. But I made sure that you know at least what a clustering is using k-mean clustering. And then we're going to focus next session on Gaussian mixture models. So we're going to focus on these two methods, OK? Any questions so far? All right, so let's go with clustering. <clears throat> so 
So clustering by definition is you wanna you wanna have you have a D data set without a label, right? Just like what you had here, black and white, bunch of data points. You wanna find a way to partition them, right? In partition your D data into K disjoint, disjoint clusters, right? You wanna group them into K different groups. And of course, the number of Ks are normally way, way smaller than the number of elements in your data. Say your data contains 20 K data points, your clusters might be like 10 or 20, right? You don't want to just go up to a million, for that matter. You want to group them in a way that you compress your data and represent them in a, in a, in a better representative group, let's say. Okay? So, as a definition, we call the clusters by S, starting from S1 up to SK, so because we have K clusters, right? And S of I is a subset of D. So these are the clusters we have. And each of those clusters, they have a cluster center, okay? So we define a center with moves, so, and they could be a vector as well. So this represents for this cluster, the center of this. Sometimes we call this a centroid, uh, depending on the reference book you are referring to, or cluster centers. And also, these are a subset of the dimensional space of R, right? There are R values. There is only two conditions, very intuitive. First of all, the, the union of all the clusters, if you add them all together and then uh, get them together, they should represent D, right? This one. And then none of them should overlap to each other in the specific case of clustering. There are so many other techniques. You're gonna see next session in um, Gaussian mixture model that those models can overlap while they are clustering or grouping things into different groups. But for clustering, specifically, and for k-means clustering, the clusters do not have to overlap each other, right? So that's your data. So if you cluster them here with this and this, so these three do not overlap. And all these three combined, the union must represent the overall D you had, okay? S1, S2, and S3. The centroid or the cluster center could be represented somewhere here, okay? Let's move one, move two, and move three. That's the center of the cluster. Geometrically speaking, it's gonna be the center. All right, so let's see how we're gonna uh, do the job, okay? How we're gonna define uh, a cluster. And then when we cluster, how are we going to define the error related to clustering? Now, if you want to calculate the error, because it's again another approximation technique, so the error can be computed for each cluster S of J as the error of J, sometimes they're represented by epsilon, so both case, or E of J either way, is the summation of all the points, all the xn's inside that cluster S, so that was your, this cluster, right? We're talking about Si as Sj. So all the points in the cluster, the difference or the distance between those points and the the mu of that cluster, the center cluster point, right? It's showing us, it is showing us the difference, the summation of all the differences between each point to the cluster center, okay? And then we sum them up, that's the square value, that's the norm. So it's gonna represent the approximation error for cluster SJ, right? So now, given D, and the number of clusters K we have, so this is the number of clusters, clusters. We want to make sure that our overall in sample error or the training error or E of N, right, which contains all of those EJs are going to get minimized somehow, right? So in order to represent that, we're going to say E of N contains several clusters 
with several centroids of the clusters and we have to add all of those EJs right to compute the EN yeah I'll, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll describe it Okay, so in order to compute that, that's simply a, a summation of all of your clusters, <coughs> all of your points, I'm sorry, all the points inside each of those clusters, okay? So all of the centers, is just combining them all, we're going to have this, okay? I'll just go, yeah, you're just jumping ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so. Now, in order to calculate the error, for mu of xn, right, the, the center cluster that represents an x point there, which is a, that was the center of cluster, we want to minimize this, right, for all of those clusters that contains center points. Okay, so as an example, k was two. We have two clusters. These these are the data. All of them are representing our d. They do not overlap. The union of these will represent the. We have mu one for s one and mu two for s two. Okay. If we increase that to three, right? Again, our data would be still d. This one turn into another two subclusters. So now we have s one, s two, and s three. Right? We have perhaps another center point here. Right. So this is the hyperparameter that k that we're going to describe how we're going to handle that. Okay. So that's just an example for computing e of uh, in sample error. Right. <clears throat> so let's have um, some application. Yeah. So I might have missed it, but is this center of clustering like one of the data points? Or? No. No. Because it's, it's in R space. It's a real number, right? It might be overlapping on top of one of the points, but it's yeah, probabilistically, yeah. Okay. Oh, there's some questions for this one. Um, why is another set like inside of another? No, we just wanted to show that this was this was a superset of all the data here, and then we, we kept the cluster S2 as S3 now. Just like before, and then we decided, you know, we wanted to break this into oh, two good. different clusters. Okay. So yeah, just so yeah. All right. So let's have some quick examples in real world application. Why we need clustering, right? So first of all, the first one is topic discovery. This is a very well known application of clusterings. Say you have n documents, right? We want to cluster them into k groups where each of the documents belonging to the same group having similar topic, right? We don't know what the labels are of the documents, but we want to make sure that when we cluster them, similar topics are into uh, similar groups, okay? So if you want to define xi and mu j, how are we going to do that, right? So xi would be the histogram of words in documents. We can generate it. And then the, the center clusters would be the histogram of the word in group J, of course, used for identifying the topic. Okay? If you wanted to refer to one of your reference books, um, in Boyd book, that, that ebook that I posted on Moodle, if you want to have to uh, have more information on that, you can refer to chapter four for that matter. Does that make sense? It's one way to cluster any documents. Like you can histogram them, and then <clears throat> the histogram of the word in, you know, 
u of j would be for each of those group j's? Like we have to find new groups. Uh, we have to? Find new j's. Like we have to find a cluster of words in that belongs to one group. Yeah. Or we are given a cluster of words that belongs to one group. Exactly, we're going to answer this problem in 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. But good thinking, yeah. <clears throat> okay, another example. You might have heard of this more, more often recently. Recommendation systems, uh, what Amazon does, uh, Spotify, I don't know, uh, Pandora, other companies, many companies are doing recommendations. So we wanna have, we wanna cluster consumers based on their common preferences, right? and provide new recommendations. So how, how are we gonna define xi, right? One way would be xi is equivalent to vector of um, you know, users. We, we, we just compute the number of times each user was streaming certain songs, right? For instance, in Spotify or Apple Music. Um, and then mu of j is the average number of times users in each, every cluster j were streaming in song. Okay, so one way to find this from the cluster is averaging that because we want to make sure that we find the middle point. Okay, this is another way to map the, this application to clustering. Is it clear? There might be other ways to define xi and uj, but that's one way. Okay. Now let's let's define a distinct um, difference between clustering and classification, because many it's, it's a very popular question. Many of you uh, might just get confused, right? They have similar names itself, but sometimes you just want to make sure what it, what exactly is a clustering, what exactly is a, a classification task, task, right? So first of all, clustering. We want to cluster d groups into k, uh, d uh, data set, right? The, the capital data, data set of d into k groups. Considering the, the application of the coins, okay? We have a bunch of coins, we want to cluster them into k groups. Then, we need to label those by hand. There was no label. I'm just going to call this group 1, group 2, and group 3, because I think that using their mass and weight, they're, they look different, they're weight different. I don't know what their name is, I just wanna make sure that these are different, right? So that's a clustering. So you apply a measuring device or you devise it out of your own, just like what we did here for recommendation system, right? We thought, oh, let's, let's measure them by the number of times that the specific music was streamed, okay? And our measuring technique was able to compute size and weight, right? Say you're, um, you're programming uh, an ATM machine or a parking machine that people just put coins on it and you don't have the luxury to have a scanner or a camera that takes take a photo out of the, the incoming coins, right? You just have some sensors in your machine that understand the size and the weight of the coin, right? That people are just incoming. And you want to make sure that they have put enough of coin so that you, um, you know, show them a specific value that their parking is valid for, right? So this is one way to do that. If, if you were trying to classify them, the other one was a more luxury option that or you had a camera or you, wanted, you, you had a sensor in, in, in a way that you would see what the coins was written, right? And you could have just understand, okay, this is a one cent, this is a five cent, this is a quarter, or whatever, right? But now, using this, you have only some data points that are coming into you, and you have to measure it one way or another, right? So you just use these two different um, metrics, so you want to measure them, and you understand, okay, I'm just going to call this type one, and then here, perhaps, type 2, type 3, and type 4. It might be correct, it might be not. So because these two are pretty close to each other, so you could have just put these two at the same type, 
and you had finally three types, right? That would be possible. So you see, um, unsupervised learning uh, techniques are normally harder to um, apply on large data because you do not have labels at this point. And then, but the problems are very, very interesting. Um, another good example would be malware uh, clustering <coughs> or malware um, detection, computer viruses, uh, or security people are interested to see some malfunctioning of things in emails, in, in a computer network that are passing through a huge network, or passing over internet, uh, or in social media, right? You have to devise ways to understand, oh, is it suspicious or not, right? But you don't know what the suspicion was coming from. You just want to make sure that, okay, is it suspicious or not? Or um, can I just group suspicious things next to each other, okay? Without knowing what they are. All right. So for instance, we decided to just come up with three clustering, okay, one and five and tens. Because we thought when we plot them, or when we uh, train a model to understand based on size and weight, these are having distinct distance between each of those other clusters, okay? So in general, the problem with optimal clustering is a very hard and complex problem in mathematics. That's why an optimal clustering is NP-hard. Does anyone know what NP-hard is? It's, it's virtually not possible, yeah. <laughs> NP-hard is, sorry? Yes, yes. So NP-hard is the hardest class of problems after you have P and NP and NP-complete and NP-hard. Um, there are so many techniques that have been discussing optimal clustering and so one of the papers that prove that optimal clustering is NP hard is this, right? It's, it's too much, uh, it's, it's completely uh, theoretical. Even in, in, in one planner, in one plane of 2D, optimal clustering is NP hard. Um, so if you expand in a higher dimension, it would be definitely at least NP hard because solving it uh, is in non, at least a non polynomial uh, problem. And when you expand the, the size, the rate of growth would be non-polynomial. So going towards millions and billions, you might end up having a, a non-efficient algorithm to, to find optimal clustering. That's why, just like the majority of machine learning models, we, com we apply either heuristics or ap approximation using machine learning. And for that matter, we use k-mean clustering. Okay? It's an approximation technique. Uh, it's a machine learning in categorizing an unsupervised learning. The, the author of this was a mathematician in late 50s. He devised this, and then, but he didn't publish the paper up to 80s. So that's the paper he published, 1982. And that's why the origin of uh, came in was 1957. Other people published some, some papers later on in, in early 60s, but uh, the original author was this guy, Lloyd, that later on, 1982, decided to publish what he was devising before, um, non, you know, informally, let's say. All right, so now let's talk about how we're going to uh, implement a k-mean clustering, okay? And that k represents the number of clusters. That's why it's known as k-mean clustering. All right, for that implementation, we have two problems. Your colleague already mentioned both of them. So we're going to answer her. So problem one. The problem one in k-mean clustering is we have given some clusters, say out of NOVA, we have some clusters, right? S1 up to SK. How are we going to find those moves of the clusters to minimize the overall approximation error, right? So that's the first problem. Let's see how we're going to tackle that. So, um, assuming we have clusters ready, how are we going to find those moves, the, the centroids? So, let's come back to the uh, formula to, co to compute E of J for each of those points, which was the summation of all the points 
<coughs> inside each cluster, right? Square. So if you like look at this formula, it only depends on SJ, right? So we only care about SJ here. And not on all the the rest of the clusters, S1, S2, SJ minus 1, and J plus 1 up to K, right? We only care about here, SJ. Suppose we have two clusters, S1 and S2, right? We want to make sure that we minimize the EJ <coughs> finding a mu J of that, okay? So it does mean that we need to minimize this value, okay? Just like that. Each of the Xn's minus mu J, okay? And the summation of all of those X's inside uh, on mu J. Does that, does that make sense so far? All right, so let's ex expand this. <clears throat> so we are trying to arrive here, okay, on each of the centroids. So let's take the gradients of that formula E of j, uh, mu of j equal to zero, right? To minimize that, talking about this one, okay? Now, if you make that equal to zero, let's first compute this part, right? So what you're gonna have is, because this only Uh, relates to that SJ specifically, right? You have to just compute that inside and the rest outside. You want to go here and expand this. So you're going to have a summation of XN inside SJ and the gradient mu J, and then you expand that raised to 2, the first element plus the second element raised to 2, and then minus 2 first and second element, okay? So we expanded this. Then you take the gradient considering that only j and they were only uh, the only parameter we, we, we were carrying was sj right so those elements inside sj so <coughs> this easily will resolve to 2 mu j minus 2 x n and then you can put this to zero right you want to minimize it finally if you compute you're going to arrive to the way we can find the centroid, mu j is equal to 1 over sj for the summation of all x n's. Okay? So this is how we find a centroid that minimizes the distance between each of the values, each of the data points inside that specific cluster. Okay? It's, it's an absolute value for that, you see? All right, so that was the first problem. We, ha we are given some clusters. How are we going to find moves? In cluster okay now let's talk about another problem <clears throat> so problem two now on the other hand let's think about it the other way around now we are given some moves right we know what the centroids are using that centroids find some clusters to minimize our EN. Okay. We, we just 
we know some centroids using the centroids find the clusters okay or <clears throat> rephrasing it would be given x's in your data point d which clusters which cluster should be associated with right for each of the x's okay <clears throat> so let let move of uh, x i denote the cluster center right as a center point so we want to minimize this let's expand that e n again now we have to expand it to all of our x i up to x n right x1 up to x n but however again the only term involving x i is happening somewhere in the middle of that right because we are specifically talking about x i here <clears throat> so if you want to find mu of x i is is an arg mean or a minimization of the distance between x i's minus mu of that specific cluster okay so we can expand this for all of those mu's mu are within the the set of mu1 up to mu k to a number of clusters <clears throat> and then easily you can see that the way to minimize this is just assigning x i to the nearest cluster because assigning it to the nearest cluster will minimize this automatically right So mu of is, is a center point corresponding to that specific xi. The cluster of xi was re, was represented inside. Okay, that was the mu of that cluster. <clears throat> because the question was, having this given xi, which cluster should be associated with, right? So. Say that again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I assign xi to the nearest cluster center, right? So this cluster center is, is that mu that you were talking about. So this. Now, we sort of uh, tackle this problem as an egg and chicken problem. What if we were given clusters, how are we going to find moves? Or what if we were given moves, let's find the clusters, right? So let's put them together in a very robust algorithm. So k means clustering. How we start that again chicken problem? We're going to initialize it randomly, of course. So we randomly initialize some moves, right? Then for those moves, now we have to find their clusters, right? You have to construct, construct clusters, S, uh, S1 up to SK, that represent uh, the answer to subproblem 2, which we just talked about it, right? How are we going to find clusters out of centroids? And that was, the answer was finding the, the, the nearest moves, right, for each of the x's that we want to cluster. Then, <clears throat> that's the first initial step. Then we're going to update the moves again by solving problem number one we talked about. So now we have some clusters. How are we going to fine tune those moves to minimize the error? Okay, so that's going to be solved by problem number one we talked about. Then we just have to repeat the process number two and three up, to, up until we want to stop it. So we, we decide our convergence was, I don't know, reaching certain error rate or some steps. Right, 10, 20, 30 steps. Okay? Is S, it's 
more than just a label, right? It holds some value to it. The sum of all the points or, or what is S? S uh, is not a sum of all the points. It's a cluster containing some points, right? It's, it's a metadata, sort of. Okay, so it's sort of a label? Yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, how, how do we take the absolute value then of S? Oh, the absolute value of S, you can compute it. With the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So that's different than this, yeah. yeah. Cool. Good question, yeah. All right. So you see that this is a very simple problem. That's why it's super fast and efficient. It's iterative, and it's, it's a good approximation normally. There are some issues and properties with k-means. First of all, it is locally optimal. It's not a global optimal solution because, as we talked about, it's an MP problem. Uh, it will not find global partition in general. You might be lucky and find the, the global one, but normally it's, it's, it's going to find good locally optimal solutions. The other issue that your colleague asked um, earlier, we need to input k-mean clustering with a k, right? We need to find, okay, let's talk about five clusters. Let's see and converge with the five in several steps. There are some other extensions of k-means because we have so many different clustering methods that are an extension of k-means that they do not need uh, an input k. They are using various other techniques to, to come up with a solution. We have x, x uh, mean clustering. We have hierarchical, uh, hierarchical clustering methods, and so on and so forth. Um, but the simplest and most intuitive version of k-mean is just uh, what you saw. Um, density estimation techniques do not need uh, clusters. We're going to discuss in uh, next session. There's a famous algorithm called EM, or expectation maximization, that we're going to uh, discuss next lecture. So it's, it is considered sort of an extension of k-mean itself uh, as well. All right? So what we're going to discuss next lecture is that EM algorithm. But first, we're going to recap some, um, let's say, fundamentals about uh, density estimation techniques and Gaussian models, right? And then we're going to conclude this, the, the lecture with EM. So we have two different versions of EM. It, it has hard EM or soft EM. So on hard EM, the clusters do not overlap, but the, the soft version of EM clusters may overlap. So again, these are different variety of the, the EM that you're going to see next lecture. Any questions so far, this lecture? All good? Okay. So I'll see you next week then, Monday.